All right, let's get started. Is everybody here for 182? Biology 182? All right, good. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Dennis Wilson. I've met half of you in lab this morning. The other half I'll meet next week on Monday, right, for lab? Yep. yep. All right. So I'm just going to go over some parts of the syllabus pretty quickly. I'm not going to give you a paper copy of the syllabus. The syllabus is posted to Canvas. There's a Canvas course. So obviously you can print it or just refer to it online. You're cool. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Obviously feel free to take notes on it. I can't imagine you'll remember everything. Um, but I do have a short, quick, and easy online quiz. It will be your first online quiz. And it is really easy, it is really straightforward, and it's really just designed to get you used to logging onto Canvas and taking a quiz. But that first quiz will be on announcements that I make now and on the syllabus. Good? All right. Okay. So like I said, my name is Dennis Wilson. Um, the important things right now on the syllabus are my contact details. The easiest way and best way to contact me is with email. You can contact me from Canvas. You can send a message by Canvas, and it just gets sent to my email. But email is the best way. Uh, let's see. Office hours, then. So office hours are, let's see. I've already noticed a mistake on the syllabus. Look, I've got office hours for lecture time. Do I? I do, don't I? Yeah? Office hours will be the hour after lecture. All right? And I, so where's lecture time? 12.30 to 1.45. So office hours will be, let's make it two to three, okay? Um, <clears throat> before lecture, I'm just coming from lab. So sometimes you can catch me in the few minutes before lecture, but usually office, you know, questions you've got to take a little bit longer. Um, so you're either going to attend a Monday or a Wednesday lab, okay? So I want you to stick to your assigned lab time. If you need to make a change, if you need, let's just say one week, oh, something comes up, you can't attend <clears throat> your regular Monday lab, you can attend the Wednesday lab, but let me know in advance. The only thing I ask is don't make a habit of it. Yeah? So do it as a way so you don't miss lab, right? Don't make a habit of it. If somebody wants to make a permanent switch, I'm okay with that as long as there's space. Just come and let me know. But again, just attend whatever lab you want to attend. Um, so textbook then. The textbook for 182 is this one or the custom edition that they sell from the bookstore. That looks like a custom edition. Is it the custom edition from the bookstore? So you can hold that one up. It's got a butterfly on the front. It says Bio 182. Okay? So that one will totally work for 182. This one, you might have bought this for 181. It also works for 182. I think they're on, did you say the 12th edition right now? They're on the 12th edition. The 10th or better works fine. Okay? 10th edition or later should be fine. It's an expensive book. I've just told you can download it for free. I don't know where. But anyway, this is the book. So lab manuals, you will absolutely, definitely, positively, 100% need a lab manual. For today's lab, I photocopied the lab because obviously it's first lab. Um, next week and onwards, I won't photocopy the lab, so you'll need a lab manual. Now get the one with the, can I borrow yours? <clears throat> get the one with the orange cover, not the green one, orange one. So you get it at the bookstore at this campus. I think the other campus has the green and the orange one. If you've got a choice, get the orange one. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go over everything on the syllabus. I'm certainly not going to read it to you. But I do want to go over your exams. You've got three exams. The dates of the exams are on the syllabus. So if I go to the last page, there, it shows you, oh, there's another mistake. Look, spring 2015, it should be 2016. So I'll catch these mistakes and um, update it. So, but here's the lab schedule for this semester. So you know the date, and you know exactly what topic's going to be covered, and these topics correspond to the lab units in the lab manual. Okay? It tells you what chapter numbers, 
correlates to textbook and it also tells you the dates of practical exams and of your in-class exams. Okay? Everybody good? Where are you going to find the dates of your exams? Your syllabus. Syllabus. That's it. And the practical exams. <coughs> now, I won't change these exam dates. They'll, they'll be fixed. If you've got a conflict with an exam and you let me know in advance and it's a good reason, then I can arrange for you to take one of the exams in the testing centre. But it really has to be like a good, justifiable, valid reason, not just because, you know, I'm kind of tired today. All right, I don't want to come in to, to take the exam. It's got to be a good reason. Um, I can let you take it in the testing centre. The practical exams, however, cannot be rescheduled for any reason. We can't set up the practical exam again. It's a huge ordeal to set up the practical exam. If you miss it, you just forfeit the points, and there's a lot of points for them. So whatever you do, don't miss a practical exam. Now, if you're driving to school and you're in a car wreck and you're carted off to hospital, still come. No, I'm kidding. You can't come. <laughs> all right? But if there's, a, if there's a real justifiable emergency why you can't attend an exam, I do need verification of it. Saying I'm in a car wreck, if you can show me a police report with the time and date, um, if you get a flat tire, right? Flat tires always happen on exam days. Um, but I want a picture of that flat tire on your car and I want a time and date stamp that correlates with the date and time of the exam. Then, all right, that's, that's okay, I believe you. All right? So practical exams can't reschedule. The in-class exams, for really good reasons, I can. Let's just say right now, within the first week of the semester, you know you've got a conflict. Like somebody else in my other class, I don't know, they've already bought tickets to Spain, flights. Then I get that. Just come tell me, you know, I've, I've already got this booked and arranged, and, I'll, and I can reschedule that for you. But if you simply don't show up on the day of the exam, or the day before you say, I don't know, something comes up, you, you can't reschedule that exam. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. If we show up in the wrecked car, is that sufficient evidence? <laughs> I guess it is. The website for the downloads in your email. Is it? Yeah. All right. I'm not quite sure I should distribute it, but I do appreciate it. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so you've got three exams, 100 points each. Um, lab drawings, talk about those in labs. So there are some chapter quizzes, and they are all online, and you'll find them all on the Canvas site. Now, I don't usually post them all at the beginning of the semester. I'll post them as we go. Now, the only thing about those online exams is I give you one attempt, usually lots of time like anywhere from three days to a week, you've got to do the exam, all right? But you only get one attempt. But here's the important thing about those exams. They will have a due time and a due date. Whatever you do, make sure you take them before that due time and date. Because as soon as that due time and date comes around, it gets, you're locked out of it. And the answers are released. And so I can't reopen it for you because the answers have all been released, all right? So if you miss one of those online exams, you just forfeit the points, okay? Is everybody good with that? That's like the hard and fast rule. So let's just say that it's um, an hour before the due date of one of those exams and your computer blows up. Is that a good reason? Will I reopen it for you? No. no. Is there any reason why I'll reopen an online exam for you? Nope. None, zero nada. Because you like us. Because I like you. Well. That's the, there's a lot that I'm flexible on. That's the one thing I'm not. And again, it's because the answers have been released. All right? So if you're worried about technology-related stuff, obviously do it in advance. I suggest you get on, do five questions, get on the next day, do another five. Yep. Until you hit that submit button, you can retake them. Does that make sense? Once you hit submit, it's done. It's a done deal for you. All right. Any questions about those online exams? No? Yeah. Um, were those the ones that are like 20 questions and you have the whole like week to do it? They'll vary you from... Do like a few a day? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Or do them all in one go. It's entirely whatever, you, whatever works for you. Um, okay. That's that. So attendance. I will probably send around an attendance sheet in lecture, but I don't... It's really just for my own information. 
All right, so I'll collect data on you guys to see what things correlate with good grades and what things correlate with learning. And I'll tell you what correlates really well with grades and learning is your lecture attendance. Okay, so I collected the data last semester. The graph kind of looks like this. Um, let's just say that we've got attendance here as a percent and we've got performance, performance there. If you've got high attendance, you also have high performance. If you have low attendance, you generally have low performance. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. So make sure you come to lecture. It's really closely correlated with your grade. But this semester, I'll be recording all of my lectures, technology permitting. Usually it works fine, sometimes it doesn't. I'm recording this lecture right now. That's why I've got the little mic just there. So I'll record them, and I'll post the lecture to Canvas. All right? The camera's at the back. It's pretty good. It tracks me. But if I run quickly that way, it loses me. All right? So it's audio and me and whatever I draw on the board. There's another piece of software that I'll experiment with, which actually captures the video and the audio and the PowerPoint, and they're all kind of separate screened together on the same screen. That was a disaster every time I've tried it in the past because the software didn't work properly. But they say they've got it dialed in and it works well now. So there's all of those options. That said, I encourage you to come to lecture, all right? Because if you watch the lecture, if you watch a recording of it, I think that's good. But what you tend to do is you fast forward. You're doing other things, right? There's no way you can be glued to a video screen of me talking for an hour and 15 minutes, all right? So you're doing other things and you miss a lot that way. So come to class. But they'll be recorded and they'll be put up online. Okay, lab I do take attendance, okay? So the attendance policy, policy for labs in the syllabus, but I do take attendance every lab. Um, cell phones, I talked a little bit about this in lab for safety reasons, but the other thing that I find, I've never collected data on it, so it's just my sort of 15 years of doing this observation. Those of you that are addicted to cell phones in class tend not to do very well in the course, all right? Some of you can, but generally you don't. <clears throat> and it has to do with the way your brain works. So on something like paying attention to lecture and answering a text, they're quite high level functions. Yeah? And so what your brain does is you can't do the same the two simultaneously. Your brain flips backwards and forwards from one to the other very quickly. And it then fills in the blanks. Now, if it's something you're very familiar with, it does a good job of filling in the blanks, right? But something like biology that you're probably not familiar with, it doesn't fill in the blanks very well. All right? So think about all the time you're on text, you're missing the lecture, and there's a, a, a little period of time where you've got to tune in and tune out in addition to what you've missed while you're on your phone. It really is a grade killer, I've got to tell you. All right. Um, so in lecture... I want you to keep your cell phones off and out of sight. Here's what don't, please don't do this. Have your cell phone in your lap and like that. I know what you're doing. It's not secret. It's just kind of, I don't know, maybe have it up in the air so I can see it. Um, don't put it under a page and try and hide it. Just keep, do yourselves a favor, keep your cell phone off and out of sight. I promise you'll benefit in terms of your learning. All right? You'll be more engaged in the class. Your mind won't be somewhere else. All right, um, let's see. Okay, I think that's all I want to talk about in lecture on the syllabus. So what I want you to do, please read the syllabus. There's an online quiz, like I said, on things in the syllabus. Here's your best way to read the syllabus. Now, it's not riveting, I've got to tell you. It's pretty boring to read. But start at the top, read every word of every sentence and every line on every page, and end at the end. Here's what not to do. Don't hop onto the quiz and hunt for the answers through the syllabus. How many of you are hunters? Yeah, about three quarters or 90% of you stick your hand up. This is what you'll do for quizzes, right? You hunt for the answers. And it might sometimes be an effective way to take the quiz, but you don't learn much from it. All right? So what I want you to do is I want you to know and understand everything in the syllabus, not just do well on that little quiz. Okay. Um, any questions about the syllabus or any businessy related stuff that could be on the syllabus? <coughs> is the online quiz on Canvas? 
It is, yep. Everything will be on Canvas. Those of you, is anybody not familiar with Canvas? All right, regardless of whether you are or aren't, at the end of lecture, I'll pull up the Canvas site and I'll show you how to access it for those of you that might need to know. In fact, I'll just pull it up real quick right now. This is what it looks like. It looks like this. Your view is slightly different to my view, but you'll see there are modules. Some things are already published and open, and some things aren't. But you can download all the lectures, um, lab drawings, and all those kind of things, and links are all on Canvas, and the quizzes also. Okay. All right. Good. Any questions before we go? Get going with the biology. So what do you need for lab next week? Lab manual. Okay, so here's what I find. Do we have any, I'm just curious, are there any, um, I don't know, ASU, U of A, or whatever, NAU students that are third or fourth year students? Anybody in that category? No, sometimes there are. Someone sort of comes back and needs to take this kind of club. You are? All right, here's what I find. Is you, now the pressure's really on. You guys tend to do very, very well in this class. Now, and don't take this personally, you're no smarter than anybody else in the class, although you might be. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, by the time you got to your third and fourth year, you've really dialed in your study skills and study habits. Usually you're a bit more serious, you get down to business, but what it really comes down to is you've dialed in study habits and study skills that work for you, all right? So I'll share a lot of study habits and study skills that tend to work well with students at your level. What it will do is it means that you will study for less time you'll get more out of the studying, and that usually translates to better performance, right? If there's a shortcut or an easy way of doing something, I promise I'll share it with you. If there is no shortcut and no easy way of doing something that I know of, there may not be. And if you find it, tell me so I can share it with the next class, all right? But sometimes there are just no shortcuts. But I'll tell you what I think are really good <coughs> study tips and techniques. So here's a recipe for success then. Come to every class on time. That includes lab. Forget your cell phone, I gotta tell you. This semester I might do an experiment with you. I'll have half the class send a series of texts, the other half listen intently to lecture and take notes, and I'll quiz you on the content. See who does better. All right, I'm curious to see what the result is. Take good notes. Even though all the PowerPoints are online, there's a lot that I talk about that are not on the PowerPoints, and I think you need to take notes on those. Okay, so why is it important maybe to hand write your notes? I know some of you might tap into a computer, but why is handwriting sometimes better for your learning than tapping it into a computer? Reinforce. Why are you more likely to remember? Why does it reinforce? The physical action of writing instead of clicking a button. Right, the brain power required for you to write is huge, believe it or not. And those neural pathways tend to be a bit more permanent than tapping a key. The other thing about taking a note is you process the information. I tell it to you, you mull it over, you understand it, you write it in your own words. What I find is if you don't understand it, it's very difficult for you to write it in your own words. All right, once you do, you write it in your own words. That again, a lot of mental processing goes on. All right, so you're more likely to remember. And here's the other thing, you've all heard of your mind's eye. Right? Your mind's eye, you can picture things up here in your mind. So <clears throat> if you were to look at that, right, and study it just for a little bit, and then an hour from now, or two hours from now, try and recall that, you can probably picture it. If you drew the same thing, you will have a much better chance of picturing it more accurately. Yep. Okay. There is a lot of value in taking notes. Read the text, the assigned text, and other sources. Now, reading the text. How many of you will pick up a chapter the night before and say, all right, I'm going to study really hard, I'm going to read that whole chapter? 
and then you start to read and about three pages into it you do this. Whoa! What did I just do? I have no idea what I did for the past 30 minutes. None whatsoever. You were probably reading, but you have no recall of what you did. You totally zoned out. So don't expect to read an entire, ta an entire chapter in one go. You can maybe read a couple of pages. So what should you do to keep yourself tuned in when you read? What's a really good tip for that? Summary notes. Sorry? Summary notes. Write summary notes. Every paragraph you read, write a one sentence summary of that paragraph. Now let me tell you, you'll go a lot more slowly, but that 30 minutes that you just wasted by zoning out won't happen. So it's actually quite an efficient way of doing things. All right, reflect upon your learning. Writing summary notes of your learning is a really good way to reflect upon them. But I tell you other times to reflect upon your learning. What are some downtimes you've got during the day? <coughs> Almost everybody's got them. Traffic Sorry? Lights. Uh, traffic lights. I've got to tell you, I hate traffic lights. If you've taken 181 from me, you're probably sick of me talking about traffic. My kids are sick of me talking about traffic lights. I can't stand them. They're life wasters. Have you ever got a stopwatch and, and clicked how long you waste your life at a traffic light? It's terrible. It's a chronic waste of life, I've got to tell you. So, use that to study. Don't open a textbook, don't look at your cell phone. See what you can do, though. You can put little things on a post-it note in the middle of your steering wheel, and you can glance at those, not as you're driving, <laughs> as, you stop to, as you stop to a traffic light. And if you get little summary notes with little diagrams, you'll picture those in your mind's eye. What are some other bits of downtime during the day? When you're in the, yeah, when you're in the toilet, yeah, and when you're in the shower, all right? So, get yourself a little sheet of paper for the restroom, right? Maybe put your study notes there. The window where you do the dishes, if you do dishes, right? And um, get yourself some shower crayons. Shower's a really good time to relax. It's very relaxing. Write on the walls of your shower. Draw some things that you had in class. It works. If you've got kids or little kids around, get some sidewalk chalk. Does anyone know what sidewalk chalk is? Or sidewalk chalk. I don't know how you say it. <laughs> get some of that and goof around with the kids in the neighborhood and draw some things. Drawing is a really powerful way to learn. All right. I was at a restaurant the other day and the guy came around and said, do you want some water? I said, what do you want to drink? I said, some water. He said, what would you like to drink? I said, some water. And he said it for a third time and I get water. <laughs> so third time always, water. Okay, so that was maybe a lot to take in. Take good notes. Don't copy the PowerPoints because they're already online for you. Take good notes. I recommend your own handwriting. If you like to use a computer, use a handwriter. Uh, use a computer. Take organized notes. Date and title them. Okay? Believe it or not, I still have all of my undergraduate notes that I took when I was an undergrad. I took them using mostly brown fountain pen because it slowed my writing down and um, it, for some reason, was easier for me to picture them. Do little sketches in the margin. How many of you are familiar with Cornell notes? Right, Cornell notes are good. They're effective. Okay, go onto YouTube if you don't know what they are. Type in Cornell Notes, and there's a whole bunch of tutorials about how to take Cornell Notes. All right. <clears throat> Does anybody see a little clicker? So we're going to start with chapter 26 then. All right, phylogeny and the tree of life. Those who have just had lab, this reinforces what we've done. It repeats some of it. Those who have not had lab yet, this is the introduction you need for your lab. So organizing life on Earth, what a task, right? What a job to try and organize and categorize life on Earth. How many species have been described? How many described species do we have? Anyone know? Take a guess if you don't know. 300 million? 300 it's a little lower than that. Um, 
30 million, a bit lower than that. A bit more than that. It's about 1.8 million described species. All right? So a lot of those are extinct species. Yep. How many species do we think we have? Because we've not described all the species on the planet. How many do we think we have? About how many? So give me a range, because we really don't know. The lower range is about. We think we've got, a, on the lower range, 10 million. What could the upper numbers be? 30 million. So 10 to 20 million is likely what we think we've got. But some folks say there's anywhere from 10 to 100 million species actually on the planet. And we've only described 1.8 million of them. Isn't that crazy? As much work as we've done. Now, most of these 10 to 100 million are probably what? What kind of organism? Maybe arthropods, microarthropods, things like mites. Let me tell you, there was a really good Nat National Geographic article um, last year about mites. And they actually looked at, I think they were at a party, some people that were experts on mites, and uh, they sampled mites off of people's faces. Did you know you've got face mites? There are mites on your faces. Most of you, right now, mites on your faces. Teeny, 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 tiny little things. Some of them don't even have an anal opening. When they fill up, they just explode on your face, right? <laughs> so, and they found that there were many undescribed species of mites in just a random gathering of people on, pe on people's faces, all right? So these microarthropods, now just imagine you started to look in the soil, in leaf litter in a tropical forest, in the fissures on a tree, yeah? So lots of microarthropods probably undescribed. What's another group that's probably very underdescribed? Microorganisms, yep, bacteria, fungi, protists, all right? There's no glory in describing a new species, unfortunately. So, all right, we've described 1.8 million. We've got, oh my goodness, 100 million species. Now we've got to try and organize that, okay? I mean, you have a hard enough time organizing your clothes in your closet, right? And all you've got is socks, underwear, and a few other categories. Now let's take all of life on Earth and try and organize it. So we're going to look at, in this first lecture, ways that we can organize and categorize and make sense of life on Earth. Because there's different ways of doing it. There's ways that we used to do it, ways that we currently do it, and directions where we're heading. Okay? All right. So the <clears throat> question is, what am I? What does it look like? If you know what it is, don't say it. But if, what does it look like if you really don't know what it is? It's in the textbook and the answer in the textbook. But what does it look like? It totally looks like a snake, doesn't it? It has a resemblance to a snake. Because what? It's long, it's got scales, it's got no legs. It totally looks like a snake. So superficially, it really does resemble a snake. But it's not a snake. So if we were to try and look at this organism and then snakes, those of you in the lab this morning, you got a real good up-close look at a snake, didn't you? You might lump this together with the snakes, all right? Based on its morphological characteristics, characteristics that you can see that are maybe superficial. But when we look at a bit more detail at this guy, we find that it's got eyelids that open and close. Snakes don't. Snakes have a scale over their eyes. They don't have movable eyelids. Snakes can't blink. This guy can. Hmm. It's got a fixed jaw, all right? A little bit like yours, it's fixed just here, and it sort of opens and closes. Not a mobile one like snakes. Snakes have a really cool lower jaw. In fact, the suture just here in your jaw, with snakes, there's an elastic ligament that goes over it. So the jaw can kind of do this and that elastic ligament can make it snap back. So it can open, and then it sort of can articulate independent each side. So when you watch a snake eat, it kind of does this, where it pulls in the food each side. The jaw of this organism and your jaw doesn't do that. It's fixed. It can do that only. 
you'll find that, that picture I showed you doesn't have very many vertebrae. Snakes have got a lot of vertebrae. And the one that I showed you has a long tail posterior to the anus. Snakes don't have a very long postanal tail. So superficially, it looked like a snake. But in fact, it's a legless lizard. It shares many more characteristics with a lizard than what it does a snake, despite that superficial resemblance. Now, if we were to take the DNA from this organism and compare it to the DNA of a lizard and a snake, the DNA sequence clusters or is much more similar to a lizard than what it is a snake. All right? So, we can group organisms based on their resemblances, but we get tricked. And we've got to be very careful at what characteristics we look at when we group organisms based on morphological similarities. So legless lizards then evolved independently in several, I guess, several different times the characteristic of leglessness evolved, all right, in lizards. And that is separate to snakes. So then we've got another way. I mean, crikey, if we're trying to group things by their evolutionary origins, and we've got several different <coughs> origins of leglessness, that makes the task even more difficult. We get tricked again. All right. So we're going to start off by looking at this topic of phylogeny, which is where we kicked off lab. And it's really important you understand this definition. So think of phylogeny as the evolutionary history of a species or a group of species. All right, a phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or group of species. And we can study classification. The, the discipline that studies classification is called systematics. So what we do as a systematist or in systematics is we try to determine the evolutionary relatedness between different groups of organisms. So I'm going to show you this with a number, a number of different ways. I'll show you how we do it and, again, an elaboration of what it means. But phylogeny is the evolutionary relatedness. And if the systematics is the discipline that studies the evolutionary relationships. And if you are someone in systematics, you're a systematist. Okay? So you try to piece together the evolutionary past and relationship of groups of species or individuals. And if you're a systematist, you want to use as much evidence as you can possibly find to let you answer those questions. So systematists use data from the fossil records. They look at lots and lots of fossils. And for an awful long time, that was one of the main bits of evidence that systematists used was the fossil record. Now, with molecular techniques, we can use molecular data. We have access to the genome of every organism on the planet, and we can extract the DNA, and we can sequence it quickly. So now, we're not just looking at fossil similarities, but we're looking at DNA similarities and differences. And then we can look at genetic data, what kind of genes, what kind of proteins, and morphological data. So there's a lot of data that systematists use to try and piece together these evolutionary relatedness. But it's really been turned around completely since the advent of easy access and quick access to DNA data so, and other molecular data. So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree, all right, which depicts the evolutionary, I guess, relationship between animals fungi, and plants. Now, this is a fairly simple phylogenetic tree. So let's have a look. Here we've got animals, all right, on this branch. Here's all the animals at the end here. Here are all the fungi, and here are all the plants. 
Now, if you were to look at this, interpret this, you would say, hmm, back here was some extinct, no longer present ancestor. Okay? And that ancestor diverged into what is modern day animals and modern day fungi. And then there was an ancestor back here, which diverged into well, this ancestor, and then plants. So from this you can infer, believe it or not, that animals and fungi are more closely related to each other than either of them are to plants. How does that make you feel? You've got more in common with a fungus than a plant. Good? Makes me feel like a fun guy. Yeah, yeah I like that one. It really does. <laughs> Uh, very at a very basic level, you share quite a lot of characteristics with the fungus. More so than you do plants. Kind of surprised, isn't it? Animals, fungi, and plants. So we piece that together with molecular data. All right, so now let's look at this discipline of taxonomy. All right? So taxonomy is this ordered division placing them into categories and naming of organisms. That's what taxonomy is all about. Taxonomy is about, let's give it a name and let's place it into ordered groups. Now, for a long, long time, before we looked at molecular data, we would primarily use morphological data, the physical characteristics that an organism had to place it into groups. For example, what characteristics do you think unite mammals? What important deep-seated characteristics do all mammals share? Well, birds. Four-chambered hearts and lactation. Birds have four-chambered hearts. But lactation. Mammals suckle their young. They've got mammary glands. No other groups do. That's something that all mammals share. What's another characteristic all mammals share? So, there, there are some reptiles that have live young, live birth. There are fish that have live birth. Good. Hold that thought, all right? Just because he said hair first. Hair. Mammals all have hair or fur. All mammals share hair and fur. Made of what? Keratin. And mammals have? Three inner ear bones. Incus, malleus, and stapes. Yep, good. Yep. So mammals share all of those three characteristics. Okay? So based on those characteristics, we can take any organism and say, all right, if you suckle your young, there are a couple of exceptions, and you've got hair and three inner ear bones, we're going to make you a mammal. We're going to place you in that group. Okay? And if you don't have those, we're going to put you in another group. And then what we can do is we can look at all the mammals, and based on shared physical, physiological morphological characteristics, we can place them into groups. Now sometimes we use behavioral data, sometimes ecological data to place them into groups. But for a long time that's how taxonomists work. Then they suddenly got molecular data. And again, it's shaking things up and turning things around and we're in a period of transition where we're doing things in a slightly different way. Rather than putting things into groups based on shared characteristics, we're depicting evolutionary relationships among groups based on their evolutionary past. Okay. All right. So this topic of binomial nomenclature. All right. So in the 18th century, this guy, Linnaeus, was responsible for coming up with this binomial nomenclature. And we still use it today. And he decided that we should group organisms into their groups based on shared characteristics that are primarily resemblances of their physiology or morphology and so on. And he came up with this two-part scientific name. All right. So each organism described has a two-part scientific name. And we call that the binomial. Okay. So the first part of the binomial is the genus. Okay? 
first part of binomial is the genus. So any scientific name, the first letter or the first word of that two-part name is the genus. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain this because in your lab, you're going to be turning in a whole bunch of drawings and other things. And I would say the most common mistake routinely made by the majority of people is getting the scientific name wrong. Just getting the syntax of the scientific name. All right? So get a good understanding. You'll get it right in your lab, lab drawings. Yep. When are the labs due? Um, if any, usually when I assign you something, I'll give you the due date. But it will no normally be the next lab period. Okay. Oh, there's nothing due from today's lab. I'll tell you in lab what's due and when it's due. So, of the two-part scientific name, the first part is the genus. The second part, it's sometimes referred to incorrectly as the species. The second part is called the specific epithet. The specific epithet. All right? The two together form the species name. The two together form the species. Okay? Right, now let's get the syntax down, because again, this is a, a common source of trouble, I think. A scientific name, the binomial, must be either underlined or written in italics. I don't know about you, I can't write in italics, but I can definitely underline something. So the easiest way for you to show that is just simply underline it. Why do we underline it? What does that signify or indicate? Sorry? Important. Mm, in this case, I guess kinder, but it shows you it's not English. It's not the English language. It's a different language. Usually Latin or Greek. Okay? That's what that shows. The next part, the syntax, is that the genus, first letter, is always capitalized. Uppercase, first letter. What kind of words do we usually capitalize the first letter? Proper nouns. Proper nouns. Yep. And it's a proper noun. That's why we give it the capital letter at the start. It's, think about it. It's not quite true. But think about it as sort of the Latin equivalent of Bill and Bob. Right? Not quite. but So it's got to be capitalized. This specific epithet is often, not always, an adjective. It's a Latin word that's an adjective. Okay. All right. So, everybody okay with the syntax then? Always underline it. Capitalize the first letter of the genus. This is the proper noun. This is often an adjective. Here's what you can do. Let's just say you were writing a scientific paper or some sort of write-up. Once you've written the scientific name in full at the start, subsequently in that paper, you can abbreviate the genus. You can just put the first letter with a dot. Okay, you don't have to write out the full genus name. Is everyone okay with that? All right. Everybody good with the binomial then? It's pretty straightforward, just a few rules you've got to remember. All right, so we've adopted this sort of hierarchical classification. So Linnaeus introduced this system. We group things in these increasingly broad categories. If we go from the species back up, or we can start broad and get progressively more specific if we start off at a domain, for example, and come down to the species. So these are some of the different taxa. Okay, these are the most common ones. They're the ones that obviously I want you to know. The broadest, most inclusive taxon is the domain. And I want you to know what the three domains are. What are the three? You should have 
I think you went over this in 181, but let's just refresh. What are the three domains? Close. Eukarya. All right, eukarya is one of three domains. The archaea, which are these organisms, they, they're like bacteria-like, and they live in these deep thermal vents in these extreme environments. And the third one, the bacteria. So there are three domains. So a domain is a very inclusive group. Okay. All right, let me tell you why I drew that on the board. Because your, your brain is very good at remembering and recognizing images, graphics. You have a very long evolutionary past with images. Oh my goodness, sometimes it was critically important for you to remember very subtle patterns, pictures, colors, and so on. Words? You don't have much of an evolutionary past working with words, let me tell you. So, you, what you'll find is that these little sketches you can do will help you remember much more easily than writing the words down. And sometimes you can even just write the first letter of the word, just as a prompt. E for eukarya, B for, and A for archaea. What you'll find is if you were to write eukarya down a few times, you all you need is the letter E to jog your memory. All right? So simply writing these three boxes might be an easy way for you to remember that. Okay? All right. Then within the domain, we have kingdoms. Now here's what you'll find is that mm, there's deviation from these taxon names I'm giving you, depending on what kingdom or group you're working with. But these work well for animals. When we talk about the fungi and plants and the bacteria and the archaea, sometimes these taxon names are not used. But they work well for animals. So within the domain, there are kingdoms. Let's think about some different kingdoms in the domain eukarya. What are the different eukarya kingdoms? Animals, Animals good. Animalia. What else we got? <coughs> Kingdom fungi. What else we got? Plantae and protista. You got four kingdoms within that domain. Okay. And then within the kingdom taxon, we have phyla. <coughs> we have the phylum. Okay. So within each kingdom, we have different phyla. And there's lots of different divisions in the animal kingdom. I'm not going to write them all. In fact, we still disagree about how many phyla there are in the animal kingdom. Okay? So what we're going to do for the first third of the semester in lab is we're going to survey the animal kingdom, all of the phyla in the animal kingdom. Okay? And of course, we can divide up the fungi into phyla, plants, and the protists also. Okay? If you go take a microbiology class, you'll be focusing on the bacteria. But you'll talk a little bit about the protists and the fungi. Okay? All right. And then within the phyla, there are classes. Within classes, there are orders. Within orders, there are family. Within families, there are genera. And within a genus, there are usually different species. Is everybody okay with that hierarchy? Yeah? So each one of these is called a taxon. The domain is a taxon. The kingdom is a taxon. Phylum is a taxon. So our classes, orders, families genera, and so on. Each of those are taxa. All right, so this graphic's out of your book, and it shows the three different domains, and it shows you the taxonomy, the full taxonomy, for a leopard. Now, 
there are other taxa, not just these listed. You can have superfamilies and subfamilies and subphyla and so on. There are other ones. These are the common ones, I think, appropriate to this level class. <coughs> so as you can see within the animal kingdom, you've got different phyla. The leopard happens to be in the phylum chordata. Within the phylum chordata, there are different classes. One of those classes is class mammalia. So anybody know what makes a chordate a chordate? In fact, oh, that's another misconception. A spinal cord doesn't place you in the phylum chordata. It'll put you in the subphylum vertebrata. And sometimes something called a notochord is confused and is synonymous with a vertebral column. We'll talk about that later in the semester. I was just curious if anybody that's knows. Like Sorry? Is it an a notochord. That's one of them. Organisms in the phylum chordata have a notochord, which is a solid rod of cartilage which runs along their body. Sometimes, for some organisms, it's only present for a few hours in their development. It goes away. Phalangeal gill slits, a postanal tail, there are other characteristics of a chordate. But they all share certain fundamental characteristics. And then within a phylum, there are classes, class mammalia. We talked about what characteristics group the mammals. And then we've got order carnivora, again, characteristics that group carnivores, and then we've got order Felidae, the cat family, genus Panthera, and then Panthera pardus is the species. I love leopards. They're awesome animals. Anybody seen a leopard in the wild? No? I've been lucky enough to see a couple of them. I'm going to show you this video. It, the videos I can't embed in, can, in the PowerPoints as I post them on Canvas. So some of the videos you won't see, some of them... Um, I'll show you in class. As a, I'll just download them or something like that. Um, so let me tell you, I'll show you the video, then I'll tell you where I got it from, where I shot it. That's a leopard in the wild. I was very, very still when it came up to me and was sniffing. I'm totally lying. I wasn't there. So let me tell you how we got this video. So I run a couple of study abroad programs. One of them is to Africa. The other one's Costa Rica. I just took a group of students to Africa this past summer. And so this particular video clip, we got one of these motion-activated trail cameras. All right, put it on a stick. This particular tree is called a play tree in the country of Namibia. And it's a tree that's quite big. It's at a certain angle, the trunk. And many of the animals in the, in the neighborhood, especially the predators, use it as their, like, signboard. All right? They'll mark it. They'll patrol it. They'll go from one play tree to another, mark it with the urine, scratch on it, have a little sniff, see who else has been there. So we knew that this tree is frequented by a lot of different animals. Leopards and cheetahs are two of the key ones. So we put a trail camera there, and of course it's motion activated. We got a um, time and date stamp, we know when it was taken. And we can actually probably, with the spot pattern on this leopard, if we get subsequent images, we'll know if it's the same animal that comes back. We'll know how frequently it comes back. And usually you assume that these trail cameras are invisible to the animals, but they're probably totally not. So the animal was very aware of it being there, and it came up and sniffed it, and it left some drool on it. And we've actually still got the camera in the prep room with the leopard drool on it. I decided not to wash it off. I thought it was cool. So that was kind of nice. And then we've got this one also of a leopard. And this one was a bit more skitty, this leopard. So this was actually a new play tree we discovered. And it's along a fence line because much of Namibia is divided up into farmland. But there's lots of wildlife on the farmland. And so this cat you can see what probably happened is it heard the click of the camera, and it's a very, very quiet click. Figured something wasn't right and just decided to leave. All right? This was a new play tree we discovered. So they put cameras. This is a place called the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, and they put these um, motion-activated cameras so they can assess what wildlife they have in the area. What a great job, eh? Who would love that job? Brilliant, wouldn't it? It's actually a pretty good picture. Yeah, not bad. They're much better now. This was a big, clunky old camera. It took like 
six or eight D size batteries and you've got to lug these things halfway around the world on a plane and if you've got eight cameras, the batteries are, are one carry on and oh, that's crazy. Now they're tiny little things with little batteries, it's much nicer. All right, so that's a leopard then. So, <coughs> linking classification and phylogeny. Phylogeny, remember, is an evolutionary relatedness among groups. Classification is about grouping organisms based on shared characteristics without really considering their evolutionary relatedness. Now, if you share characteristics, chances are you're closely related from an evolutionary perspective, but not always. So sometimes they jive, sometimes they overlap the phylogeny and the classification, and sometimes they just don't. In lab, we looked at a good one. So think about whales, right? Whales all share characteristics, and we lumped them as a group, right? And then we've got certain antelope and other animals that we've lumped as a group based on their hoof patterns and their hoof configuration. But it just so turns out that whales and hippos are quite closely related in an evolutionary sense. But they don't share very many morphological characteristics, do they? They do at some level. So now we're sort of deciding what do we do with this, where the classic taxonomy and classification is at odds with the phylogenies. And we're just figuring out what to do with it, how to resolve it. All right. So to look at these evolutionary relatedness, we construct something called phylogenetic trees, which gives you a branching pattern and shows you who's related to who. When it matches, great, everyone's happy. But sometimes it doesn't. And then we've got to decide what to do about it. So the next example shows you where they match quite nicely. The evolutionary relatedness and the classic taxonomic approach of placing things into group based on shared characteristics, they match. So here's a phylogenetic tree constructed using some DNA data and other evidence. And then we've got these traditional order, family, genus groups that were constructed way before the advent of phylogenies or DNA data. So we've got this order carnivora. We broke the order down into a number of different families, one being the Felidae, which are the cats, the Mustelidae, which are things like otters and badgers, and then the Canidae, which are the dogs. Okay, so in this phylogenetic tree, the only genus in the cat family is the genus Panthera. We've got two genera in the Mustelidae, right? We've got the, the badgers and we've got the otters. So in our classic... Linnaean taxonomy, these two both fall in the Mustelidae. When we look at their evolutionary relatedness, yup, they're linked together as well. They share a close evolutionary past. And then these guys are linked in the Canid family, the dogs. And again, when we look at coyotes and wolves, they share a recent evolutionary past. So this is where their evolutionary origins match their classification, classic Linnaean classification. Everyone okay with that? All right. So just here, at this point on the tree, we would have an ancestor, which is probably extinct now. But this ancestor is, was an organism that was present sometime back in our past. And it diverged, it changed, and gave rise to the mustelids and the canids some organism in our past that we don't know what it is, okay? So the Mustelidae and the Canid share an ancestry and they share a common ancestor which would be at this branch point. Similarly, just here, coyotes and wolves shared a common ancestor back here. Some animal that's probably extinct, which diverged, gave rise to the coyotes and the wolves. Is everyone okay with that? All right. But sometimes they differ, sometimes quite significantly. So systematists have proposed a filer code as a way to try and deal with this. All right. And again, we're still not sure 
how to reconcile it in some ways. And so we're deciding to maybe recognize only groups that include a common ancestor and all of their descendants. So it really is looking at classifying organisms based on their evolutionary past and ignoring the sort of morphological characteristics in some ways. Now, in some ways that's nice. It makes it very neat to do that. But sometimes DNA evidence is the only evidence that will enable you to construct a correct phylogeny. And if you don't have the DNA evidence, what do you do? We don't have DNA from dinosaurs, right? Where do we place them? How do we construct a phylogeny? We can still use fossils, but that's morphological data. And sometimes that can lie to us or send us off into the wrong evolutionary direction. So think of these phylogenetic trees then as representing a hypothesis, all right, about evolutionary relatedness. So we construct these hypotheses using data and every branch point in the tree represents a divergence and an ancestor that was common to both branches. All right, and I'll illustrate that with a couple of examples. So I'm going to give you these terms, all right, and then I'll show them on a phylogenetic tree. So phylogenetic trees have branch points. That's a point of divergence. Think of a branch point as being like this. There's a branch point, it means there was a common ancestor, some species that was probably present at some point in the past is probably extinct now and gave rise to both branches. <coughs> Sister taxa, let's just say this is taxa one, taxa two, could be a family, could be an order, could be a species. But these share a common ancestor, and they would be sister taxa. Okay. Many of the trees are what's known as rooted trees. And a rooted tree includes a branch to an ancestor which is common to everything on the tree. All tax are in that tree. So a rooted tree might look something like this. Here would be your root. Okay. There's some ancestor here, which is a common ancestor to everything else on that tree. Some trees have something called a basal taxon. So in the case of this tree, this would be our basal taxon. So a basal taxon would be a group that originates very early, right down the bottom, and it's usually off by itself. So here was an ancestor, here's our two lineages. This is our basal taxon, because it's at the, think about it, it's been at the base of the tree. Now, sometimes, and we don't like this, we get this situation. There's a common ancestor. It doesn't split into two groups, but we get three simultaneously emerge. That can't happen, really. Now, we call this a polytomy. And polytomies emerge when we don't have enough data to resolve what's going on. So in this case, here's, let's just say we've got taxon one, taxon two, taxon three. It either goes like this. Taxon one, taxon two, taxon three, or it might go like this. Taxon one, taxon two, taxon three. One of these are correct. Okay? In other words, one and two are closely related to each other, or two and three are. 
in a polytomy. Okay? We don't like these. But sometimes we don't have enough data to say, hmm, is it one and two are more closely clustered, or is it two and three? <coughs> is everyone okay with that? So we just gotta wait till we get more data to resolve that. All right, so this is the one that's in your book. Okay, diagram that's in the book. All right, <clears throat> so there's a branch point. Everyone okay with that? You can see lots of branch points, can't you? That's where a lineage diverges. Okay? There's our ancestral lineage, common ancestor to taxons A through G, all the tax are on the tree. At that branch point, we've got a common ancestor to all of the taxa. So there's an example of a polytomy. All right, it's an unresolved pattern of divergence. D, E, and F, we're not quite sure about who is more related to who. There's our basal taxon, the one that branches off very early. It's the first one, usually out by itself. So give me an example of two sister taxa. B and C. Yeah, B and C would be good examples of sister taxa. Okay. Everybody okay with that, those different points on the tree? Yeah. All right, any questions about that tree or points on the tree? Yeah. So D, E, and F wouldn't be considered sisters, they would be called the poly. They're a polytomy, and we wouldn't, sister, there's only two in a sister taxa, two. And we don't know which a sister taxa, either D and E are or E and F, but we don't know which. Now, if we could give, if this, obviously taxon A's got a name, chances are this ancestor here, there's a taxon there. So these could be sister taxa also, the taxon there, taxon there, but we're not given that information on the tree, so we don't know what it is. All right, so there's lots we can learn about phylogenetic trees. <clears throat> so they show patterns of descent, evolutionary relatedness, not necessarily phenotypic similarity. Usually they do, but not necessarily. So they don't indicate when a species evolved or how much change occurred in a lineage. Sometimes they do, and we can use, there are techniques we've got to put a time scale on this, right? But all we know, for example, we know that these share more similarities with each other than they do taxon three. So presumably they split more recently from each other than what the ancestor did of these two from taxon three. Does that make sense? So we, we can't put a time on this. We just know that these are more similar than this one. So this branch occurred more recently than this branch. Do you want okay with that? So sometimes we might get this. So again, we can't really put a time to it, but what we do know is the difference between these two is probably, le is probably less than the difference between these two. And so we know that this probably occurred further back in time, or at least before the divergence that occurred here. Good? Isn't it possible to carbon date all this stuff? So there are ways that we can put a clock on it. Yep, yeah, it's tough. Because like, the way I... So the, we can use the fossil record to depict some of these, and we do. But if we don't have the ancestor, we can't carbon date yeah, it. Yeah, like the exact, but we can do it within like 100 years to 1,000 years, something like that. It, so it all depends what information we've got. So with, you know, if we're using molecular data to construct this, we might not know when this occurred. We can use the fossil record to calibrate, and I'll talk a little bit about molecular clocks that we can use. But unless we've got something physically, physical to date, like a fossil, 
or, or something, we, we can't put a time on it. All right. And it shouldn't be assumed that one taxon evolved from the taxon next to it. Okay? So in other words, this didn't evolve from this because when they diverged, presumably, none of this was around. Right? <coughs> So what you can say is sister taxa have a common ancestor, but you can't assume that one taxon evolved from the other. Okay. So I love this tree. This is an awesome tree. This is the sort of thing that's like, whoa, what is going on? So have a little look at this for a moment and see if you can sort of depict the relationships here. Some of them totally make sense, and some of them are like, what is going on? I talked about it in lab this morning a little bit, so those of you in lab this morning will get an idea. So does it make sense then that the mammals are the basal taxon and that those reptiles are clustered together separate from the mammals? Does that make sense to you? Totally does, doesn't it? Yeah, they're quite different organisms. So now within the reptiles, look, what on earth are birds doing there? Birds are more closely related to crocodiles than crocodiles are to lizards and snakes. Does that seem crazy? Totally does, doesn't it? It seems crazy. But once we got the molecular data, plugged it all in, yep, these are more closely related than crocodiles are than snakes and lizards. So we think birds are simply a group that diverged. They shared a common ancestor with crocodiles. And this group just very rapidly changed. In fact, the current hypothesis is that there were certain groups of dinosaurs that birds were an offshoot of. And they very rapidly, morphologically diverged. But believe it or not, birds and crocodiles share some characteristics. Again, I talked about this in lab a little bit. So, I believe I got this one right. I'm pretty sure. Birds have a four-chambered heart. I think so do crocodiles. Some of the other lizards, uh, their heart's kind of weird. It's not quite a good four-chambered heart. All right. Birds sing to attract a mate. Believe it or not, so do crocodiles. They don't quite sing. They more like bellow. I wouldn't call it singing at any stretch of the word. But none of the other reptiles do that. Crocodiles build nest. So do birds. None of the other reptiles do that. Crocodiles, birds will sit on and incubate their eggs. Crocodiles do something similar. Some of the crocodilians will brood their eggs. They'll kind of lay on them to give body temperature. Some of them build a nest, cover it with rotting debris, and then the heat from decay provides the heat to incubate the eggs. And then crocodilians sometimes defend and patrol their nests, just like birds will do. So they do share some things. There is some more than just the molecular data to indicate that. And now what they're doing, which I find absolutely fascinating, is they're filling in the blanks here. We don't have DNA from dinosaurs, but based on a lot of evidence, we think that dinosaurs and the crocodilia and the birds are all very closely related. So now... They're, they're actually looking at fossils of dinosaurs where a dinosaur is like curled up over a nest of eggs. And they're saying that was a brooding behavior. They think that dinosaurs were vocal because the crocodilians and the birds are. I mean, some of this you actually get from Jurassic Park a little bit, don't you? You see it. So it's kind of, you know, I think their, their biology is actually not too far off in some ways. But anyway, so that's a good example where the... Linnaean taxonomy, the phylogeny doesn't work, doesn't jive together. All right, we'll wrap it up there then, okay?